Well, like most of all of you, actually, I'm a convert to orthodoxy for Protestantism. And in the flavor in which I was raised, uh, we had a saying that most of the sacraments were this way, but baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace, or outward sign of an inward work. And basically, what we were trying to say is that the getting wet part of baptism was not really that important, but it was mostly just a testimony to other people of what was going on inside your heart. So, you did it. I mean, we kind of did it because we felt like we should. You know, we didn't want to neglect it, but we really didn't feel that it was completely imperative either because what really matters is what happened inside the heart, what happens inside your head at the moment of baptism. Um, but in the Orthodox Church, we actually teach and believe quite a bit differently. We teach that the Holy Sacraments are more than just mere symbols of something greater. We teach that the sacraments actually do something. They actually do something to the person, both body and spirit. Now last November when the Harshman family was was uh, joined to the church through baptism, they certainly did get wet, didn't you? <laughs> didn't you? Um, I still remember when Xander came up the third time panting, almost hyperventilating. <laughs> and he says, I didn't know I was going to get that wet. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> um, and one by one, all five of them were submerged in water three times in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And if all they got out of that was wet, what a waste of time that was. Right? All it was was just a really good, pious skit that we did. Just pretending to do something because what really mattered was in the heart. That's not what the Orthodox Church teaches. Uh, more happened that weekend than just five wet people coming out of a, a dressed up horse trough. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, what happened was that the Harshman family was joined to the One Holy and Apostolic Church. And in that moment um, of obedience to Christ, the Harshman family's bodies and hearts were simultaneously baptized. And their sins were forgiven. Um, each time we say the symbol of faith, the Nicene Creed, one of the lines that we say, we confess that we believe in one baptism for the remission of sins. Remission means forgiveness. They're put away. They're wiped away. Your sins are forgiven. And when we say that, whether we know it or not, we're confessing that we believe that the baptism that we receive actually baptizes our hearts at the same time as it does our bodies. And in that moment, our previous sins are completely cleansed and forgiven. Which I think is just awesome. And a lot of people, even we did as Protestants, we said that prior to being Orthodox. I don't think we really knew what we were saying. We didn't really mean it. I mean, you know, we would we would sometimes in our in our heads say, but they really meant baptism of the heart, not the real baptism. Because we always thought it was what mattered inside, what mattered in your hearts and in your in your head. But you know, a lot of people would then ask, well, how does just dunking in water three times bring about the forgiveness of your sins? And the answer is, it doesn't. Quite simply, it doesn't. Just dunking yourself into water three times is not the formula for getting your sins forgiven. In the book of 2 Kings, in chapter 5, we read about the story of Naaman. Do you remember him? He was a commander in the army of the Arameans, and Naaman had a skin disease called leprosy. It was bad enough that, that he wanted to get it healed. It wasn't bad enough, apparently, that he needed to be kept separate from the rest of the people because he was a commander in the army and he was a very notable man. Um, but at one point, um, one, of, one of the children, one of the young, young girls from Israel had been taken captive and had been taken into to the land of Aram and <coughs> had been given to him as a slave girl. And she'd been faithful. And she talked to her master. She's a slave, but she talked to him. And she says, you know, you need to go back to Israel. There's a man in Israel who can heal you, who can heal his leprosy. And so Naaman then goes to meet the prophet Elisha. Um, what's interesting enough about this is that when Naaman gets to the prophet Elisha, 
he doesn't, Elisha doesn't even come out to greet him. He doesn't even come out to talk to him. He sends a messenger out. And Naaman thinks this is rude. And almost leaves because, you know, I'm a commander in an army. You should come out and meet me. And Elisha didn't. And you know what else Elisha didn't do? Is he didn't stand over him and wave his hand over this leprous spot and call on the name of the Lord and heal Naaman. Nope. He told Naaman, through the messenger, to go to the Jordan River, the filthy, dirty, stinking Jordan River in Israel of all places. Not a river that he loved in, in Aram, but he, the one in, one in Israel. And dunk himself seven times into the Jordan River and he would be healed. Well, this is ludicrous. He throws up his hands and he just about leaves. And then he's talked into, you know, what can it hurt? You're already here. You've come this far. Why not try it? So begrudgingly, Naaman goes to the Jordan River and he gets in the water. And I can just picture it. He's, he's looking at his servants on the side of the river. He says, don't you laugh. Don't you even smile. I'm going to do this, but don't you even laugh at me. And he gets out there, and he probably waits for a while. He's standing in the water, he's looking at his leprosy. And he dunks. And he comes up, and he checks. Still there. Don't laugh at me. <laughs> right? And he goes down again, and he comes up, and he checks. And nothing. And a third time, and a fourth time, and by now they are probably laughing, and he's lost track of them. He's County, right? And a sixth time he goes down and comes up and nothing. And you know what? If he quit, he would have walked away without healing. But he was obedient. He went down the seventh time. And when he came up, the laughing stopped. Because Naaman was healed. Immediately upon coming up out of the water the seventh time, he was healed, and not only was his leprosy gone, and maybe he had scars left or something like that. He had that sense that his skin was like a baby's. It was brand new skin. Dunking seven times in the Jordan River. <coughs> what he thought was stupid, now is, wow, it's healing. It's, it's, it's healing. <clears throat> Naaman could have gone home to Aram and found another river, a cleaner river, and dunked himself. He could have done it seven times or seven hundred times, and he still wouldn't have come out of that river clean. He wouldn't have come out healed. Another person with leprosy could have seen Naaman in the Jordan River and jumped in right behind him and dunked himself seven times, and he would have come out still with leprosy. How is that? How does it work? that Naaman was healed by dunking himself seven times in the Jordan River when it wouldn't have worked in another river and another person couldn't have done it. Why is that? It was because he was being completely obedient to the command of the man of God that healed Naaman. Okay? It is the same with holy baptism. If on the same day of her family's baptism, Jenny had decided, I don't want to get all dressed up and go over to the church and do all that. I'm just going to fill up my bathtub at home, and I'm going to dunk myself three times in the bathtub, and she would have come up out of that water the same as she was before. No sins forgiven. No joining to the, bat or to the church through baptism. None of that would have been efficacious. Someone else could have, that same day before we all got up here, Joseph and I hauled water in buckets and buckets and buckets up here to fill up this, the baptismal pond. If that same, if another person had come into that same water, into that same trough of water, before we ever got here, and had dunked themselves three times into the same water you guys were, that person would not have their sins forgiven, and that they would not be joined to the one holy apostolic church. They would not be orthodox just because they came and jumped into the tub of water that you guys did. That's not how it works. The reason that being dunked by the priest into the baptismal font three times in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit has any efficacy at all is because the Harshman family was being completely obedient to the command of God at the same time. Faith, obedience, water, dunking, 
in the name of the Holy Trinity, it all goes together. And when it happens, the person comes up wet on the outside and forgiven on the inside and joined to the church. That's how it happens. And I think that's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then the thing is, man is not only spirit. Neither is he simply a body. He's not just physically physical matter. In order to be truly human, truly man, there has to be unity of both body and spirit. Both things have to be together. And Hollywood even understands this. <laughs> they understand that when the body and the spirit are separate, that this is an unnatural and most unwelcomed state in which to be. A body without a spirit is shown as a zombie. A spirit without a body is shown as a ghost. Neither of which is typically portrayed in a good light in Hollywood. It's not a preferable state in which to be. And when we die, our bodies are laid to rest in the earth and most of us decay and return to the ground. Our spirits, on the other hand, are with the Lord. And while being with the Lord is a wonderful state in which to be, it's still unnatural. We're separated from the body, and that's not good, and God knows it. It's not the final <coughs> state that we will live throughout all eternity. You see, at the second coming of the Lord... He will somehow, mysteriously, take all those bodies who have died and who have been laid to rest in the earth, who have been burned up in fire, eaten by sharks, blown up, and whatever. He will somehow, mysteriously, take all those bodies, remake them into a new glorified body, and we still have a body separate from a spirit, but God puts them back together again. Your spirit will be rejoined with your body for eternity. That is the natural state of man. That is what Jesus is right now in heaven. Jesus is not some spirit. Father Michael often says Jesus did not hang up his man suit and ascend into heaven after what we read at the end of Matthew. That's not what happened. There is complete unity in Christ between spirit and body and there is a full human being in heaven right now in Christ. <coughs> And there will also be full human beings in heaven in each of you and I. Okay? And I think that's awesome because, you know what? We're told in scriptures to encourage each other with these words, too. And with these kind of pictures, this is an encouragement. We don't have to live in these sinful, corrupt bodies forever. There's an end to it. There's an end in sight to the pain, to the arthritis, to the fibromyalgia. There's an end in sight. Thank God that we get to separate for a minute and have that body remade and then be brought back together again for eternity to be with Him. That is what we're supposed to do and supposed to be, be looking forward to. And when Adam fell in the Garden of Eden, he not only fell in spirit, he fell in his body too. And all of creation actually, all of creation fell at the same time. And because of this, it isn't just man's spirit that needs to be restored. It's man's spirit and his body. And because man is both body and spirit, when you're baptized and you come through the experience completely wet, you, your heart also comes through the experience, experience completely cleansed of sin. There's two things that happen in baptism. And every holy sacrament that we encounter in, in obedience is the same with a simultaneous effect on both the body and the spirit. Whether, whether it's marriage, even, even Paul says, I tell you a mystery. I don't know how it happens. We don't know, but we do know that both spirit and body are affected by the Holy Sacraments. Now, why is this important? Because as a Protestant, I was told that what mattered was what happened to the spirit only. And what happened to my body was just simply a side effect. I got wet. Right? But we do not believe or teach that in the Orthodox Church. In fact, we teach that the heart is cleansed completely of past sins in baptism, but the body now begins a lifelong, actually an eternity-long process of physical and often measurable changes. We begin to speak differently. We begin to think differently. And we eat differently. And we work differently. We are different. We don't just act different. 
Our bodies are changing. We are becoming different. We are partaking of the body and blood of Christ every time we go through Eucharist. Our bodies are physically changing because of that. They have to. And it doesn't happen overnight. But with time, those around you start to see changes. And I've told Krista and I've told Deacon Joseph a few times that I see so many differences in them since our conversion to orthodoxy that I don't always see the differences in myself. They're, I guess they're too gradual or something. I don't know. I'm not looking for a, a congratulation or a pat on the back or a compliment or anything when I say this, but it feels good to know when, when my mom or when Krista or Deacon Joseph or somebody tells me, no, I see it, and here's where, and here's what, and this is what I notice. And thank the Lord that there's changes going on in my physical body, too, that are not just in my heart and in my spirit. Um, and I do praise God that being in His church and partaking of His body and blood changed both our hearts and our bodies. We want both changes. Why I bring all of this up has to do with the, the epistle that I actually read today from Colossians. There's a lot of meat in that this morning. And we read from the, actually the middle of the third chapter. Uh, but oftentimes in Scripture, God through the author's sandwiches that meat between two really thick pieces of bread. And um, I want to go back a little bit to the beginning of the chapter, and I want to go progress to the end of the chapter as well as we do this. We're going to discuss the whole chapter basically because we can eat the whole sandwich. We need to see the whole picture of what, what Paul was trying to do in this third chapter of Colossians. So in the first 11 verses, Paul is talking about the believer's baptisms. He says specifically, If then you were raised with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ is. And he also says, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So he's showing you died, and you're raised with Christ. He's showing what happens in baptism. And yes, in baptism our sins are forgiven. But we also have to remember it, our baptisms, and remember that in that moment, we also died to this world. And we were raised again with Christ. That's an important thing to remember because our bodies and what we do with them after baptism must change. They have to. And we're, we are to begin to seek the things above and no longer the things of the earth. And Paul then tells us what these things of the earth really are. He, he lists them. He says fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which he calls idolatry, covetousness. Wanting other people's things is idolatry. He tells us to put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, and lies. He tells us to put off all those things. And he says that we've put off the old man and put on the new man. Our bodies have been changed, he says. And we're being renewed in knowledge and in the image of Christ. So what we've put off is the old man. What we've put on is Christ. All right? So we, we put that on in baptism and then we take in his body and blood every time we do the Eucharist. We can't help but change. But let me ask you this. Is it evident in your life that you have put off the old man and that you have put on the new man? Is it evident in your life <clears throat> have you put off the old woman and put on the new woman? Have you put off the old boy or girl <coughs> and put on the new boy or girl? Does that happen? Is it evident to those around you? Or are you still the same person that you used to be? Yes, you've been baptized into Christ church. You're in. Yay! And that amounts to about a pile of beans if your body isn't changing. Would it? If you were to make an inventory of your sinful actions, your thoughts and your words and your deeds and everything that you did prior to baptism and make a list of those things. And then make a list of the things that you do now that are unhealthy, that are, that, are, that are missing the mark right now, would those lists be any different? Would the list you make of your sins before your baptism and the list you make of your sins after your baptism, would they be different? Would the second one be shorter? Or would it be the same? Hopefully it wouldn't be longer. Right? But are you able to see the changes in your life? Are others able to see those changes? Now listen... I'm going to talk to you kids right now for a second. If before your baptisms, 
you were disobedient, if you were talking back to your parents, if you were making them have to tell you over and over to do certain things, are you different now? Or are you doing those same things? Are you still being disobedient? Are you still making people, your parents, tell you over and over to do the same things? Then you need to listen up. Listen to the Apostle Paul, even if not me. He says that we need to remember our baptisms and that our sins are forgiven and that we've been changed. You are to be different. You are called to be different now than you were then. You're to put off anger. And you're to put off lying. And you're to put off disobedience. Landon, Joel, Rebecca, and Xander, are you better now than you were before your baptisms? You better, you better be. If you're not, you might want to start. And parents, adults, I'm going to talk to you now. Myself included. If before your baptism you were guilty of anger, of wrath, of filthy language, or laziness and sloth, sloth, if you were guilty of overeating, or being covetous, what you call idolatrous, uncleanness, or focusing on your own wants and needs over those of others, if you're gossiping and judging other people, are you now different? Those sins that you were doing beforehand, are they different or are you doing the same things today? Are you still having fits of rage? Are you still letting unwholesome talk come out of your mouth? Are you still excessive worrying? Are you still pursuing your own desires over the desires of other people? Are you still overeating? Are you still having lustful thoughts? Are you still wasting time and being guiltiness of being lazy or sloth? Are you talking bad about others and judging their motives too? Are your actions any different today than they were before your baptism? They better be. If not, you need to start right now. It's easy for us to get caught up in this rut in our lives. and we, we, We've always been this way. It's just who we are. It's our personality. And we think that, you know what? <laughs> That's not true anymore. This is not who you are. You have put off the old man. You have put on the new man. And you have died to yourself and your life is now hidden in Christ. You are a new boy. You're a new girl. You're a new husband, a new wife. You're a new parent. You're not the same person you were before your baptism. And you need to remember that and to act accordingly. And let those changes that, that affect you not only affect your spirit, but affect your body as well. And begin to produce fruit. It needs to be visible to your spouse. It needs to be visible to your parents, to your children, and to your friends. We need to let the changes brought about by our baptism actually be seen by other people. We used to walk among the sons of disobedience, Paul says, but no longer. We've been baptized into the body of Christ, into his church, and those old things have been put aside. So what does he say this new man, this new woman, or this new boy or girl should act like? Well, Paul tells us, he says specifically, we put on tenderness, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, or he calls patience. We put on patience with our kids, patience with our parents. We bear with one another. We forgive one another if we have a complaint against them. We let the peace of God rule in our hearts. We're thankful. We let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. With grace in our hearts to the Lord. And he says, but above all these things we put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And I like this. Whatever we do. He lists a bunch of things. But he basically says, if I miss anything, let me cover it all. I'm going to put that umbrella over it. Whatever we do. Whether it's in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through Him. That's what your life should look like. If you make a list of what you were like before your baptism, which has been forgiven, by the way, and make a list of who you are today, they should be black and white difference. They should be radically different. That You, you shouldn't even hardly be able to compare the two people. So how does this play out in our lives practically? Well, Paul gives some examples, and he doesn't leave anyone out, which I like this. 
He says, wives, Betty, Jenny, Krista, submit to your husbands as fitting to the Lord. Even if he's mean, even if he's lazy, even if he talks too much or if he doesn't talk enough, even if he leaves his dirty socks on the floor or drinks too much or whatever, as much as is fitting in the Lord, wives, you are instructed to submit to your husband. That's what the new woman looks like. That's what the new woman does. Husbands, Jeremy, Alan, Russ, you're to love your wives and not be bitter towards them. Even if she tries to tell you what to do, even if she drives you crazy with her demands, and even if you think she isn't respecting you like she should, do not be bitter towards your wife. That's the old man. The new wife, no, the new man loves his wife. Children, Landon, Joel, Xander, and Rebecca, you are to obey your parents in all things, because this is pleasing to the Lord. He said, obey your parents in all things. Even when she tells you to pay attention in church, Rebecca, obey your parents in all things. Right? And this means that when they tell you to get in the car, you get in the car, and you stay in the car, and you don't get out of the car again. Right? This means that when they tell you to go pick up poop in the yard from the dog, you take the bag out there, and you go pick it up, and you don't argue and complain about it. Right? This means that when you're told to do the dishes, you don't stand in front of the dishes for five hours and get a hundred squats before you do it. That's the old you. That's the old Landa, the old Rebecca and Zanna, the old you. The new one doesn't do those things anymore. That's what you need to be focusing on, changing from that old you into the new you. You are to obey your parents because it pleases the Lord. Now, fathers, Jeremy, Alan, Russ, you are not to provoke your children. Do not purposely make them angry or antagonize them. This is discouraging to them, Paul says. And then to the rest of us, including John back there who I've missed. Well, I'm for the children. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I told him. He was a kid. <laughs> the rest of us, Jeremy, Krista, Alan, Jenny, Russ, John. We are to obey our masters, not with lip service, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. This means that we obey our supervisors at work. This means that we obey our overseers in the church, whether it's Deacon Joseph or Father Michael or Bishop John, and we don't do it with lip service. We don't go, well, they're well-meaning, but they just don't understand. They don't get it. Mm -mm. You can't do that. You obey your overseers. You obey those people. And it says to do it with sincerity of heart. Don't give lip service to it and make them think or make yourself feel like you're obedient. You obey. And it says fear in God. And then it says whatever you do in this life, no matter whether it's at work or at home or at church or on your own, you are to remember your baptism. You are to do whatever you do from your heart as to the Lord and not to other people. Do right all the time. Let the changes to your body from your baptism be evident to the other people. <clears throat> Let it be as evident as it was to Naaman and to those on the side. That his leprosy was healed. There's not even scars left. It's baby skin now. <coughs> That's how much different <coughs> baptism should be in your life. The old leprous person that you were to the new person that you are. And do that knowing that you will receive the reward of inheritance from the Lord, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if these changes are not made, and you continue in the behaviors you exhibited prior to your baptism, Paul says that we will, in specific words, we will be repaid for what we do. And there is shown to us no partiality just because you happen to be baptized into the Orthodox Church. There's no partiality for that. He doesn't show favoritism. You are different. And if you're not, you're repaid for it. So our baptism is a momentous and a life-changing event. Our sins were forgiven and our bodies were changed. And as you go through this week, kids, adults, take a look at your thoughts, your words, your actions. 
and compare them today with your life before your baptism. Are you different? Are you changing? As Father Michael put it, are you loving more and are you sinning less? Put off that old man and put on Christ and let this spiritual and physical reality, this change, be evident in your life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, God is one. Amen. Amen.